All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Back to Basics Concurrency. My name is Arthur O'Dwyer. Uh, I also do C++ training. If you have new hires who need training or uh, want to brush up on C++ 11 or 17 or 20 or anything like that, uh, give, me a, give me an email. It's right there on the uh, slide. And uh, I'm also the chair of the Back to Basics track at CppCon. So uh, let me know uh, how you like the Back to Basics track this year. Um, and uh, without further ado, let's get started with concurrency. So here's all the stuff we're going to be talking about today. We're going to talk about data races. We're going to talk about mutex and unique lock, condition variable, once flag, uh, new primitives that have been introduced in 17 and 20, uh, a couple of idioms that might be useful to you in writing one-off uh, concurrency code, such as the blue-green pattern. And maybe if we have time, we have some bonus slides. Um, this presentation is geared toward people who are just getting into concurrency. They're like, what is it? How do I, like, what is a mutex? How do I use that? Uh, if you are working in a domain where uh, you have a lot of threads, you're talking about green threads, you're talking about fibers, you're talking about, uh, you know, send, receive, and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, ASIO, this is not the talk for you. Uh, you're going to need a different talk. Uh, you're going to need a bigger boat. Um, but this is the little boat for the uh, Back to Basics track. So what is concurrency? Uh, there are two words you're going to hear thrown around a lot uh, in this domain, concurrency and parallelism. And a lot of people will use them as synonyms, and then there will be people who say, no, 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 these are not synonyms. They have very distinct meanings. Uh, and I'm kind of in the middle. Uh, you know, you can go either way. But roughly, I would say that to me, concurrency uh, – is uh, the meanings in the name from the Latin, concurrent, running together. Um, so these are things that are happening sort of at the same time, but maybe you're just switching back and forth between them. I might say if I'm multitasking as a person, if I'm writing my slides and I write a couple slides and I go answer some email and I write some slides and I answer an email, uh, that's concurrency. On the other hand, parallelism means literally doing two things in parallel simultaneously, literally in the same instant. For example, I might be writing my slides and also listening to music or, or listening to a radio show in the background. Um, those are two things I can do simultaneously. Um, in extremely broad strokes, I could say that parallelism is a problem for hardware. If you have multiple CPUs, you have the capability for parallelism. Uh, concurrency tends to be done more in software uh, time-sharing operating systems, multi-threading. Um, there is some overlap. Intel's hyper-threading is basically uh, switching back and forth concurrently between things on, uh, on hardware. Um, but fundamentally, these are the kind of things you should have in your head for an intuition about these terms. So why does C++ care at all about concurrency? Well, back in 98 in C++03, uh, standard C++ did not have any concept of concurrency or of threads or threads of execution. Uh, uh, you would well single threaded, and you would just use a platform-specific library such as pthreads, um, like libpthread, and you, you add it to your link line, and it provides uh, some, some somewhat standardized functionality that you call the, to make threads on your operating system. Um, the problem with that is that then the standard language couldn't really say anything meaningful about multi-threaded programs. And if everyone's going to start writing multi-threaded programs, we really don't want them all to have undefined behavior, right? Uh, if we have two threads, thread A and thread B, in a pthreads program, and one of them writes to an int and the other one tries to read from the int, will that uh, second thread ever actually see that write? Um, standard C++ 98 and 03 didn't say um, because they had no concept of what it meant to have thread A and thread B in the first place. Um, so uh, C++11 is going to fix that, as we'll see. Um, also, this uh, uh, impacts what kind of optimizations the compiler is allowed to perform. If I, my original code has an int and I originally initialize it to 0 and then uh, set it to 1 and then sleep for a while, set it for 2, uh, sleep for a while, set it to 3, um, is the compiler allowed to rewrite that to say, well, I see what you're doing here. You're setting x to 3, and you're sleeping for a total of 200 milliseconds. Can I just do that? Is, is that an, a legal optimization that will make your code smaller? I mean, it won't make it faster. It'll still take 200 milliseconds, but it'll make it smaller and, and you know better in some sense. 
but is that legal to do? Or do I need to have X be at two somehow for some sense of the word? So the C++11 answer is unambiguously, yes, you are allowed to do this optimization um, because uh, no other thread can possibly be looking at X uh, during the execution of this code. As far as any other code is concerned, this is a black box. Um, no other thread is allowed to be looking at X while I'm modifying it, and they don't know exactly when I'm modifying it. And we're going to see how C++11 um, turns that idea into formal codified wording um, in about one slide from now. The other thing that's going on with concurrency on com in computer programming is that not only is the compiler allowed to rewrite your code, but the hardware itself can effectively rewrite your code and reorder accesses uh, because of things like uh, cache lines, right? Your L1 cache has, let's say, 64 uh, bytes in each cache line. And if you write to A sub 0 and then A sub 100 and then A sub 1, the compiler, or sorry, the hardware is quite likely to reorder that, even if the compiler doesn't. And effectively, what you're doing there is two writes to one cache line and one write to another cache line, and those will be published to other CPUs in some order that is not necessarily the order you wrote it in. So when we're designing uh, multi-threaded programs, these are all the things that might happen under the hood, and we need to use the guarantees given to us by standard C++ uh, to make sure we don't have to worry about these kinds of things. So in C++11, we get a memory model is what they call it. Um, it is uh, a formal model of what it means to be a multi-threaded C++11 program. A C++ program consists of one or more threads of execution. And uh, each of those threads of execution executes basically independently of the others. Uh, and they communicate via memory. But every write to a memory location in, in memory anywhere uh, must, what we say, synchronize with all other reads or writes of that memory location. So if I'm writing to a particular variable or a particular you know, star p, and someone else is at the same time reading or writing to that thing, um, then the program will have undefined behavior. Uh, we can establish these synchronizes with relationships using various standard library facilities, such as Mutex and Atomic. Um, so how do we create a thread of execution. Um, in pthreads, you'd create a new thread by calling a third-party library function, uh, you know, out of libpthread. In C++11 and later, uh, threads have been standardized, and therefore there is a standard way to create a new thread. The standard library owns this idea now that this is how you create a thread in C++, and the way you do it is to create a std thread object. That's a library class from the uh, thread header. Um, mm. The constructor argument to std thread is a callable. Usually these days it'll be a lambda. It could be a function, uh, but usually these days it's just a lambda that says what you want the thread to do. This is your job, thread. Your job is to execute this lambda, which will print hello from thread B. The new thread starts executing immediately. When its job is done, the thread has nothing else to do, and so we say it becomes joinable. This is kind of a confusing term, join, to mean like finish up. Um, but think of it as uh, a, th a single thread of execution branches at some point, and now we have two threads. And then at some point, their their threads sort of join back together. One thread joins the other, and now we have a single thread again. So um, before you destroy any std thread object, you must call dot join on it. And this call will block, if necessary, until the other thread's job is finished. Block here is a synonym for wait. So here, uh, I make a std thread variable called thread b, and I initialize it um, with this lambda. By the way, I'm, I'm taking this lambda and saying, given this lambda, make me a std thread object, which I'm going to call thread b. Uh, so it has a job, and that job is to print hello from thread b. This immediately starts executing. There is, uh, there's not a way to say, uh, put it off until later. There's no thread.start the way there is in some languages. It just starts right away. Um, we will see soon how to deal with that. Um, so in some order, this is going to print uh, hello from thread A, hello from thread B, or maybe the reverse. Um, and then thread A is going to call dot join on the std thread object thread B. This says uh, I, thread A, 
am going to block and wait here. My, my running is blocked now by this obstacle, which is I am waiting for thread B to be done with its job, and then I will clean it up. I will, I will join with it, um, and then at some point after that, I may call the destructor of std thread. That will then at that point be safe to call. Um, we have a question. Is there advantage of having a lambda versus a function for thread start? It depends on uh, how much stuff you have to do there. I mean, if it's something like a worker thread where you have some complicated job for the worker to do, yeah, like a while loop and something, and maybe you push that off into a function and you just say, start a thread with my job. Cool. Uh, if it's something simple like this, you know, on a slide, even in real life, I, I would totally use a lambda for this. It's a one-liner. Why would I make a separate named function for some one-off thing? So that, that's what I'd say. So we don't, so that was how we create a thread. So how do we get the result of that thread that we've joined. Um, threads don't have explicit results. There's no way to ask a thread, hey, what was your status? Um, because joining with the child thread is a synchronization uh, operation. So here I create thread B, and its job now is to print hello from thread B and then to store 42 into result. Then uh, in thread A, meanwhile, Right, that instantly starts executing. Now in thread A, I say hello from thread A, and then I block and wait for thread B. And only once thread B is done with its job and has written to 42 into variable result, and I have joined with thread B, then I read out of result. Right? The, the write to result happens first. Well, first the initialization of result happens, and then I create this thread. And then this thread writes 42 to result, and then this join returns, right? This join might start before the result happens, but it's going to block until this thread is done with its job. And then finally, uh, I read the result. And so this is thread safe code because we do not have a data race here between the write to result and the read from result. They are separated by the synchronizing optimization. Uh, and we say that the, um, the read synchronizes with the write and vice versa. But here's an example of a piece of code that does have a data race. Um, so here, this is a terrible slide code. Um, but I'm going to create thread B, and I'm going to say that you, your job, thread B, is to run this loop that just repeatedly uh, prints out and increments this counter uh, until reaching some deadline in the future, 10 seconds from now. Uh, and meanwhile, on thread A, I'm going to be doing the same thing, um, incrementing the counter and printing it out. Uh, this is a data race because it could happen that uh, thread A and thread B simultaneously try to increment counter. They both try to write to it, or one tries to write while the other is reading. Those are both data races. Uh, and a data race on a regular, any kind of variable, including int, uh, is undefined behavior. Right? No synchronization exists between these two axes simultaneously, and that's a uh, that's undefined behavior. We can fix this using the standard library type std atomic, which is a template. So std atomic of int makes me an atomic int. You can make a std atomic of any trivial data type. So, you know, ints, pointers, uh, even floats, I think you can make an atomic float. Um, and this minor change completely fixes that physical data race that we had because by definition, according to the standard, Every access to an atomic variable implicitly synchronizes with every other access. So here, I have uh, thread A and thread B, and they're both trying to increment counter simultaneously right, at the same time. Um, but by definition, because it's of type std atomic of int, each of those accesses, each of those reads and writes, synchronizes with everything else that's going on in, in the program, or every, every other access that, to that variable that's going on in the program. Um, so there's still what we might call a logical race or a semantic data race where um, the behavior of this program is kind of unpredictable. Um, it depends on how the threads are scheduled, what you see as output. Uh, you might consider that a bug in real life, but it is not undefined behavior according to the standard. This has perfectly well-defined behavior. Right? It, it never has UB. Um, so let's talk about the... Uh, the way that threads start. Um, so I said that threads always uh, start up 
uh, running immediately. There's no thread.start method. You just create a thread and boom, you've got a second thread and it's running as far as you're concerned, right? It, it may actually be blocked somewhere in the operating system waiting for a CPU to become available, waiting for some resources to become available. But as far as you know, it's running right away. Um, so what if we didn't want that? What if I wanted to create a thread and set it up and say, this will be your job, but not yet. Hang on. I have a little more setup to do on the main thread. In thread A, I'm going to print hello from A. And then I want to do something to unblock thread B. Uh, and then let thread B do its thing. And, and then maybe I also do something in thread A and then I join. Um, so can we tell thread B to wait until thread A unblocks it? Uh, the answer is yes, naturally, uh, using what the standard calls synchronization primitives. And we're going to look at the, re the rest of this talk mostly is talking about different synchronization primitives. So first, a non-solution. Um, this is the busy wait solution. This is what you might actually do if you hadn't attended this talk. You might think, here's what I'll do. Uh, I know that I can uh, make an atomic bool where accesses to it don't cause undefined behavior. They all synchronize with each other. Um, and then B will just wait until uh, the ready flag becomes true. And it'll just do a while loop. It'll just zip around in a loop over and over and over. And meanwhile, we'll, we'll carry on in A and eventually A will set ready to true. Um, this is not a data race because ready is an atomic. However, this is also not what you want to do for several reasons. Um, so the main thing that is wrong with this that you should see every time you, you look at a piece of concurrent code, look for this kind of busy wait. This is a, a while loop that's saying like, I'm just going to keep doing something uh, until this condition is true. And my something is not helping us progress toward that condition, right? Thread B here never stops working. It, it never goes to sleep. It just keeps checking over and over and over. Um, this is like someone's in the bathroom and you're standing outside rattling the door handle. Uh, it does not help and it may even hurt, right? You're using resources that the other person might actually be using, you know? Um, so on a single core system, this is a huge waste of time. Um, so you really don't want to do that. Uh, also, this code has undefined behavior for other reasons, which is that uh, the, the read and write do not cause a data race, but the compiler can see that this condition cannot possibly change as a result of anything thread B is doing, and it might hoist it out of the loop, right? Just test once at the beginning of the loop, store that in a, in a register, and just test that register, and it turns out, oh, well, in that case, this is either, either it drops through immediately or it's an infinite loop, and the compiler is allowed to generate that code. So again, even with atomics, uh, you want to watch out for doing things that the compiler might optimize in ways you didn't expect. So there are many reasons not to do this kind of busy wait loop. What could we do instead? Here's one real solution. This is the simplest solution, not necessarily the most appropriate for production code. Um, but I, I, think it, I think it's decently appropriate. Um, but uh, I've had people tell me, what, this is crazy. Um, here's how we're going to do this with std mutex. Uh, what is a std mutex? It's a mutual exclusion mechanism. So mutex, mutual exclusion. Um, that doesn't, still doesn't really tell you what it is, um, but it, at least it tells you what it does, kind of. I compare this to the, uh, the key to the bathroom in the coffee shop. Um, you know, you, you go to a coffee shop, you remember coffee shops? We used to go there and there would be other people there and, you know, it, it was, those were good times. Um, so you would go and, and then eventually you'd be like, well, I need to use the restroom and you would uh, go up the counter and you'd ask for the key and you'd get the key and, and you'd take it in It'd be on some sort of spoon or something, you know, and, and you'd go in. Um, and as long as Alice is holding that key, Bob can't enter the restroom and vice versa, right? And then when you're done, you, you return the key, you, you release it, and then someone else can acquire it. That's what a mutex is, right? It has two methods called lock and unlock. The lock method acquires this unique resource, whatever it is, the, the key attached to the big wooden spoon. The unlock method releases and returns that key so that someone else can use it. So here's what we do. We make one key, mutex, MTX, and uh, thread A locks it. Now thread A holds the mutex. Thread B, then, we start it running. But the very first thing it wants to do is lock that mutex. So it will now have to wait. It's now in line outside the bathroom, and it is waiting uh, to get that key. Uh, so it's blocked there. Meanwhile, 
Meanwhile, so that's what that other thread B is doing. Meanwhile, in thread A, we go on, we print our hello from A, and then we release the key. We, we unlock the mutex. Uh, that allows thread B to wake up. At some point, it, it will say, oh, yes, the key is available. I will now get that. Um, I will immediately give it back, but now I can go on and do my thing. Um, so then uh, we do some other stuff, and eventually we join thread B. I'm sorry, this little uh, black bar keeps popping up at the bottom here. Um, and then we say hello again from A. Um, we have a couple of questions about the busy wait, uh, whether you should put a yield or a pause inside the loop, um, whether maybe if you're on a uh, multi-core system uh, that could help with latency. Um, those questions are out of scope for this talk, um, but I think the short answer is yes, maybe, but if you're asking the question, you probably shouldn't be doing it yourself. Um, So uh, let's talk some more about std mutex. So that was an atypical use of std mutex, where we were using it just as a gating mechanism on thread B. A more typical use for a mutex would be to protect some data, just again like in the coffee shop analogy. The coffee shop bathroom key protects the facilities of the physical bathroom. Um, here, I have a token pool class, um, and it has two members, one of which is a mutex, the other of which is a, a vector. And the mutex protects the vector of tokens. Every access, every read, every write that we do to that vector must be done uh, according to my class invariant that I as the programmer designed. I've decided that every access will be done under a lock on the mutex. This is an invariant that will be preserved, and this makes my class token pool thread safe. Two different threads can now call get token at the same time. They will both attempt to lock the mutex. Um, one of them will succeed and then proceed, and the other one will fail and, and have to wait until the other one releases it, unlocks it at the end of the code. Uh, and then while we have the mutex, we are allowed to do whatever we want with tokens as long as we get it back into some stable state you know, at the end, and, and then we unlock. Um, protection must be complete. If you are using a mutex to protect some, resor some resource, you must use it consistently. This is necessary for correctness. Here I have two functions, get token and num tokens available. And I say inside get token, if you're modifying the tokens array, you need to lock the mutex first. Um, by the way, if you're wondering, is this bad code because it's not using unique lock? Yes. Wait a slide. Um, so uh, in this function, uh, we are modifying the tokens vector. Um, and so we lock the mutex. In num tokens available, that is a simple access or simple getter. Just give me the size of the vector. And so the programmer thinks, you know what? That's just like, just read the, the size. I don't actually need to lock the, uh, the mutex for that, right? It's a read. But no, that is not correct thinking. Right? Um, if someone is calling get token at the same time that someone else is calling num tokens available, the one calling get token will hold the mutex, and they will be doing writes to the vector. And if the other thread, thread B, is reading from tokens at the same time, just read the size. That is a data race. A write plus a read gives you a data race. Two reads don't, but a read and a write, those are bad. So if you protect only your writes, and then someone else is doing unprotected reads, you have a data race. So protecting a variable with a mutex must be 100%. Protect every access, or else it's no good. The only exception for that is in uh, things like the constructor and the destructor. Um, because if you're destroying the object, obviously nobody else has a handle to the object anymore because you're now destroying it, right? That would be a bug of a different class if, if they uh, tried to use it while you were destroying it. So there you wouldn't need to take the mutex. But this code would be bad. So let's see how to fix this code. We also have a problem here with uh, exception safety, right? Because uh, there is a potential bug here. If uh, token create or pushback uh, throws an exception, we have a bug. They throw in the exception. We have locked the mutex, but uh, we never call unlock because exceptions, when they're thrown, abort the, uh, the execution of the function. We never call unlock. Um, so we should look for a way here. Anytime we have a resource, we should look for a way to follow uh, RAII principles. Every cleanup action, uh, freeing uh, resources freeing heap allocated pointers or unlocking mutexes should always be done inside a destructor. So 
Here's how we're going to fix that. We're going to make an RAII class. In fact, we're going to use one out of the standard library. In the standard library, in the mutex header, right next to std mutex, you will find std lock guard. That is a uh, class template. Uh, it takes as its parameter the type of the thing you're locking, which in this case is std mutex. And in its constructor, when I construct this variable LK of type lock guard of mutex, uh, I give it a mutex, a reference to a mutex, and it locks that mutex. In its destructor, it will unlock it automatically. Now, if pushback throws, uh, the destructor for lock guard will run and it will unlock the mutex and I no longer have that exception safety bug. Uh, also, that's a one-line fix for num tokens available. I don't have to worry about where do I put the lock and the unlock. I just define at the top of my function. Uh, I have a local variable named LK of type lock guard. Here I'm using the C++17 um, class template argument deduction, so I don't have to write mutex if I don't want to. Um, this is one place where, even though I normally hate CTAD, I might say maybe it's okay here. Um, and uh, right, so we lock the mutex, we return token size, and at the end of this function, at that closing curly brace, we destroy the lock guard and that unlocks our mutex. So a mutex locks is a resource, just like a heap allocated uh, T star, uh, where when you're, you're done with it, you call delete, locks did mutex. When you're done with it, you call dot unlock. We have a unique putter to help us manage unique ownership of heap allocations. And likewise, we just saw lock guard, but just like unique putter, we have unique lock also to help us manage unique ownership of mutex locks. And just as functions can pass or return ownership of a pointer, functions can also pass or return ownership of a mutex lock. I can write a function here uh, here I've got two functions named foo. Uh, one of them takes in a unique putter that is a, a heap allocated int, um, a handle to a heap allocated int. And uh, you know if some random number, some random condition, uh, clean it up uh, and then return either null or uh, the pointer that we got in, that all works fine, right? Since uh, C++, well, C++14 because we're using implicit move here. Um, but uh, right, the, this is a heap allocated resource that I can prematurely clean up if I want. I can pass it around to a function, from a function, whatever I want. Similarly, with unique lock. This is, LK here, is a unique lock uh, on some mutex, and it knows what mutex that is. It has captured a reference to that mutex. And uh, I can prematurely clean it up if I want, uh, or I can just pass it back to my caller. I can pass it around from function to function. This all works fine. Std lock guard is a special case. Std lock guard is not movable at all. Um, it can be a little bit more efficient that way. It doesn't have an empty state. It's just either you construct it, you destroy it. That's it. That's all it is. So it's a little bit more efficient. Um, if you're compiling with optimizations, uh, it doesn't really matter, I don't think, whether you use unique lock or lock guard. Uh, but I would tend to say, if you're not going to pass it around, use lock guard. Um, if you are going to pass it around, you have to use unique lock in order to make it movable like unique putter. And unique lock, just like unique putter, is of course movable, not copyable. By the way, there is also a uh, std scoped lock in C17. It is a new and improved lock guard. Um, it can take multiple mutexes at once, and it internally has an algorithm, usually based on sorting their addresses, to figure out what order it should lock them in. Uh, so that if you do have something like you arrive a merge tokens from a uh, function that takes uh, the, this uh, pointer and another token pool and wants to lock both of their mutexes. Um, so here I use a scoped lock and I pass it both mutexes. And even if I'm merging tokens from A into B and from B into A simultaneously, this will not cause a deadlock um, because it will internally lock the, the locks in the correct order. Um, so this is a very rare thing that, that you would have to use a uh, scope block to lock multiple locks, but uh, I was kind of pleased to come up with this motivating example for it. All right. At this point, we have a question break. Um, I'm looking at the questions that the uh, volunteer has pasted to me here. I think we've actually done most of them. There was a question about uh, how is std thread implemented? Uh, does it have... Uh, are there primitives backing it up that are uh, talk aboutable? And I think the answer is std thread does tend to be fairly complicated and does tend to end up being based essentially on pthreads. 
uh, at least on POSIX systems. On Windows, of course, it's based on Windows stuff. Um, so uh, using std thread instead of one of these third-party libraries not only makes your code correct C++11 and later, uh, it also helps with portability. Um, is it safe to mix standard library threading with the underlying P threads or Windows threads? Um, in general, I think the answer in practice is yes. Uh, as far as the standard is concerned, the answer is no. Uh, that's the sort of thing where if it breaks, you don't come to the standards committee and complain. You have to go to Stack Overflow, and they will tell you it doesn't work, uh, workarounds, and so on. Uh, what would I prefer between unique lock and lock guard, and why? Um, I would prefer lock guard in the case that it is just limited to a single scope. If I needed to pass it to another function, I would have to use unique lock uh, because that is the only one that is movable. Lock guard is immobile. Um, if a resource is going to be written by one thread and read by another thread, are there read-write locks? Yes, and we will see them. C++ calls them shared mutexes. Uh, we will see those in a couple slides. Um, I think that is it for now. Uh, oh, uh, one more. Was scope lock introduced to solve the deadlock issue? Um, that is uh, one of its purposes. Um, another one was just that lock, the existing lock guard, I don't think played well with uh, CTAD or something like that. There, there was some reason they needed a whole new um, uh, class for, for this instead of just uh, expanding lock guard. Um, but even in C11, there is a library function, std lock, uh, that handles the deadlock for you. All right, what do I just like about CTAD? We'll save that for the hallway track. All right, metaphor time. All right. Let's move on to more complicated uh, synchronization primitives and see our second one. So I'm going to use this metaphor a lot. I like this. Um, we have two people in this metaphor. We have Pat, Pat the postman. Pat is going to deliver a letter. And we have Frosty the snowman. I don't know. I found this clip art. And Frosty is waiting for to receive that letter, right? Pat delivering the letter to Frosty. Think about what those, uh, those two initials could stand for. Um, here's our algorithm, our procedure for Pat delivering a message to Frosty. Um, mailboxes, flags, and symbols. Frosty goes to sleep next to the mailbox. Pat puts a letter into the mailbox, raises the flag, clashes her symbols. Her, her symbols wake up Frosty. Frosty is asleep next to the mailbox. He's, he's been asleep this whole time. But when he wakes up, he heard a loud noise, he wakes up, Pat is nowhere to be found. They don't communicate directly. But he sees that someone has raised the flag on the mailbox, so now he can look in the mailbox and, and in fact, sees the letter. Um, there are some subtleties here, by the way. Um, Frosty is a light sleeper. Uh, truck goes by and backfires. He might wake up. He might look, uh, but the flag is still down on the mailbox, so he knows he can just go back to sleep. All right? there, there are some things like that, but this is our fundamental metaphor. Um, and this brings us to our next synchronization primitive, which is called, another, another name that doesn't really mean anything, condition variable. So let's say that in our token pool class that we're building, if we have uh, no uh, token create, we, we just populate our uh, vector of tokens at the beginning a certain number of tokens, and we hand them out. And if someone asks us for a token and we have none, then we were going to have to block and wait until someone else returns a token, and then we can hand that one out. So here's my new token pool. I have a vector of tokens. I have a mutex still protecting tokens, and I have a condition variable. And we're going to add one new member function here, return token. And what it's going to do is someone gives us a token, and I'm going to put that token back into the token vector. So step one, I take the lock, because every access to tokens must be protected by the mutex. Um, I modify tokens. I'm putting my message into the mailbox here. Uh, I'm raising the flag on the mailbox at the same time because the flag on the mailbox is, is tokens empty, basically. Um, and then I clash my symbols. Uh, condition variable has a method called notify one. It also has a method called notify all. Um, notify one will wake up one uh, individual who is waiting on that condition variable. Notify all will wake them all up. Again, they could wake up spuriously when a truck backfires, but we're not worrying about that at the moment. Um, on the other side, here's Frosty's side. Um, we have a get token function. And what it's going to do is take the lock on the mutex and look at the tokens vector. Is it empty? 
This is our mailbox flag. If the mailbox is empty, then we're going to go to sleep next to the mailbox. When we go to sleep, uh, we are no longer looking at the mailbox and we drop our hold on the mutex. The mutex here controls um, the, what am I saying here? The mutex here controls access to tokens. So as long as our behavior depends on the mailbox being empty, we need to hold that mutex. Um, so what cv.wait of lock does is uh, it takes the lock, or sorry, it already has the lock. It will relinquish the lock and go to sleep, and it will do that atomically. There will be no little gap where someone else could steal in, grab the lock, modify tokens before we went to sleep. It will atomically drop the lock and go to sleep. Uh, once it wakes up, it will try to reacquire the lock. It will wait until it has done so, and then it will return to us. So when it returns, we still have the lock. We dropped it while we were asleep, but now we have the lock again. And again, we can look and see if anyone has gotten the mail for us. Um, we drop out of the loop, uh, assuming there is some mail for us. Uh, we pop something off the back of tokens, and we return that token to our caller. So this is our condition variable. Um, in slide 26, why isn't it a lock guard? Um, it actually could be a lock guard. Uh, the reason that uh, I made it a unique lock is so that I could manually unlock it here uh, before doing the notify. Um, in previous versions of this presentation, I would also sometimes reverse those lines and do the notify before the unlock. Uh, semantically, it doesn't matter for performance. People keep telling me it's a good idea to do the unlock before the notify. And so that's what I've done here. In order to manually unlock it, it needs to be a unique lock because that is the only type with, a, with an empty state, right? A lock guard holds the lock all the way until it's destructor, and I wouldn't be able to manually unlock it here. I could add an extra scope of curly braces, but that would take more lines. So whenever you have this pattern of a producer and a consumer, where the consumer must wait for the producer, and this production consumption cycle happens over and over, such as in our token pool, such as a task queue, a work queue, a channel in the go sense, then you almost certainly want to have a mutex plus a condition variable. Uh, we will see later, I'll have one slide on promise and future. We're not going to talk about them a lot in this talk. They are implemented internally in terms of mutex and CV. Promise and future would be appropriate if you just had a producer talking to one consumer and it was a one-shot deal. For something like this where it's a loop, a task queue, a channel, you want to use a mutex and a condition variable. Um, of course, if you can use something like uh, threading building blocks, uh, Intel TBB, if you can use you know, for some applications, maybe you want to use ASIO type things. All, there's all sorts of libraries out there, um, especially if your program is fundamentally concerned with concurrency. Again, this presentation is geared to people who are just getting into concurrency, uh, who maybe have a one-off task that requires you know, using a mutex correctly. Um, if your program is fundamentally concerned with multi-threading, you're going to need a bigger boat. All right. So... C++11 made the core language know about threads in order to explain how concurrent writes to int cause UB, but concurrent writes to atomic int don't. But C++11 did another cool thing as well with this idea of threads in the core language. Uh, in main here, I make two uh, threads, T1 and T2, and I am saying that their job in both cases is foo. Foo is a function here, um, takes no parameters, and it has a static local variable of type complicated object. So T1 and T2 will arrive at this line concurrently. Right? There will be no synchronization between T1 and T2 when, when they get here. Which one of them is going to perform the constructor of complicated object? And what is the other one doing while that's going on? In C++03, when you had a, a static variable like this, like a singleton, uh, you had to do things like there's a double check locking pattern. And anyway, it's all UB because there were no threads. In C++11, it is as easy as make a static local. This is a valid uh, inline function that returns a reference to a correctly initialized singleton. Only one thread will initialize this singleton when it gets there. The first thread to arrive starts initializing the static instance, the static uh, variable here. Any more threads that arrive will, according to the standard, block and wait until the first thread succeeds on blocking them all or Throws an exception, uh, which means it's 
exiting out, it, it's done, the object didn't get constructed, and then one of the waiters will unlock and it will try its turn. This is known as thread-safe static initialization, and this is standard since C++11. You don't need any special additional synchronization in order to make this work. It just works. So suppose you want a singleton per instance of some other object. So you can't use a static, but I have this, um, this uh, data member of a logger. So each logger has its own optional network connection. And I have this uh, get connection function that the first time you call it, I want it to create a new network connection um, and populate the optional. Um, but this code is clearly unsafe. It's not thread safe if two threads call getcon concurrently um, as the first call, uh, because they will both look at con, they'll see it doesn't have a value let, they will both construct a network connection, they will both try to write to con, this is a data race. How do we fix that? Um, well, one way to do it is protect it with a mutex. This is totally fine, um, and we have seen this already, protect it. mutex. Now this code is safe, but it is perhaps, that was weird, a right, little glitch there, but it's perhaps slower than it uh, could be, right? Because now every time we call getcon, we have to try to lock that mutex. Uh, and if there's a lot of contention, this is going to be very slow. What we can do is we can use a new primitive in C++11 called once flag or call once. So a once flag object is a concurrency primitive like mutex or condition variable, but it only has one method, and that method for some reason is implemented as a free function, not as a method on once flag. Um, it takes the once flag as its first parameter, but this is basically, think of it as the only thing you can do with a once flag is you can call, call once on it. When you do that, you give it some sort of job to do, and every time this line is reached, um, if the once flag has not yet been done, um, if no one has succeeded at this task yet, we will try this task, queue the waiters behind us to attempt this task uh, if we fail. The first one to succeed at this task sets the once flag to done. Um, and from then on, anyone who calls call once on it just says, oh, the task's already been done. I don't need to do anything else. This is more efficient mutex every single time. So this mimics so C++11 does uh, thread safe static initialization, um, but it does it for a non-static variable such as a member variable. Um, so uh, this is where you would use once flag. Uh, I see a lot of people using once flag for global variables, using once flag for static variables. You don't have to do that, right? This is the intended use case for once flag. So here's a comparison of the primitives. Um, which I believe we are running far behind, and I am going to move on quickly. Sorry. Um, C++17 is a reader-writer lock that someone asked about in the questions. A reader-writer lock is known in C++ as a shared mutex because there are two kinds of ways that you can lock it. You can call just regular dot lock and dot unlock, which are called by unique lock. This gives you an exclusive lock, a what we would call a writer lock, on the reader-writer lock. However, it also has functions called and unlock shared. And these are your read lock functions. As many threads as you want can all be sharing the same uh, lock shared. Like you can have many threads concurrently called lock shared. They're all readers. Um, and uh, they all do their reading stuff. They all unlock. And then finally, a writer can get in. A single writer can get the exclusive lock and do its writing thing. So this is a reader-writer lock that we in C++ call, for some reason, shared mutex. The terminology is different, but if you're familiar with pthreads RW lock, it works the same way. In C++20, uh, we also add semaphores. A semaphore is a bag of poker chips, very similar to our thread pool. This is now sort of built into the, the uh, library. Um, it has two methods, acquire and release. Um, acquire. Uh, removes a chip from the bag, uh, and if there are no chips available, it will block until there are chips available. Uh, release returns a chip to the bag. Um, we assume that you acquired a chip earlier. If you didn't and you just keep releasing chips and, and adding things until the bag overflows, um, that's undefined behavior. Um, but yeah, it's basically a, a counter that can go up and down and up and down, and if it gets to zero, it blocks until someone else bumps it up. 
Uh, chips are indistinguishable, interchangeable, and not tied to any particular thread. This is different from a mutex lock. You can't pass a mutex lock between two STID threads. The thread that has it locked is the thread that has to unlock it. That's just part of what it means to be a standard mutex. Um, but you could use a counting semaphore as a kind as a kind of mutex um, whose locks could be passed between threads. You would just give it a maximum of one. Right? Someone has the one token, they can pass it across to another thread, that other thread calls release, that's totally fine. Um, this makes our uh, token pool uh, slightly safer to use. Um, if you saw my CppCon 2019 talk, back to basics smart pointers, uh, you saw me using unique putters for interesting things like uh, open SSL uh, certificates and things. Here's another example where I'm using a unique putter um, to say, uh, you have a handle to a semaphore, and when you're done with this token, I want you to call release on that semaphore. Um, someone asks, do we ever need to use volatile? No. That was easy. Please don't use volatile for anything ever. Um, also, in C++20, there is a, another thing besides semaphore. We also now have latch. STD latch is an integer counter that starts positive and counts down towards zero. And when someone reaches the latch, they will then wait at the latch until every other thread has reached the latch. That is, until the counter has gone down to zero, and then they were all unlock. This is a one-shot starting gate mechanism. Wait for everyone to arrive here. We have a counter that says how many people haven't arrived yet. Once everyone has arrived, I'll let you all go. That's a starting gate. Uh, latch is similar to uh, once flag or promise or future that there's no way to reset it. It is a one-time thing. If you want another latch, destroy this one and create a new one. It's a one-time thing. Um, if you want a reusable uh, starting gate, uh, what I might call a pace car mechanism, if you're familiar with auto racing, um, you have a barrier. STID barrier is essentially a resettable latch. Um, so again, it has a counter. We, uh, as people show up at the barrier, uh, they block and they wait. Uh, once the appropriate number of people have arrived, uh, the barrier lets comes down and lets everyone go and begins a new phase immediately, atomically, such that if someone comes around and starts waiting again immediately, they will block and they, they will wait again until everyone has come around and done one lap, and then they will all get to go and come around and do another lap, and they'll unblock and let them all go. So this is a pace car. Once everyone's caught up, unblock everyone, atomically refresh the barrier. Um, Rob says, uh, talking about uh, passing semaphore tokens between threads, uh, wouldn't you need some method to pass the token safely? Um, no, uh, sort of yes, sort of no. Let's take that one to the hallway track as well. Um, what's the difference between uh, blocking these threads and then letting them go versus joining them? Um, Two things. Number one, join blocks the thread that calls join until another thread finishes. A latch, you call latch.wait from the thread that's running, right? Not the main thread, but the, act, the thread that's like going around. And it blocks that thread until some other thread gets also to that point or also to latch wait. Uh, or sorry, latch arrive and wait. Um, and then let's them all go. I actually have a couple of examples in the slide, so that might help. Um, there are some subtleties to slid barrier I'm glass glossing over. It's it's really a class template. It defines a completion function. We'll see an example of that. Um, it has possibilities for undefined behavior if you use it wrong, so it's important to read the documentation. Um, here is how I might use latch to solve our thread starting problem. Remember, threads start immediately running, uh, but what I can do is I can make a latch uh, with the counter initially set to two. I expect two threads to call arrive and wait on the latch. Uh, here's my thread B. Its job is step one, arrive and wait at the latch. Wait for the other thread to arrive. So that's what it's doing. It's blocked there. Now, meanwhile, in thread A, I print hello from A, and then I also arrive and wait at the same latch. Notice I'm capturing a reference this latch. So my latch here and my latch here refer to the same uh, local variable latch. Now, both of my threads have arrived and waited at the latch, and so the latch lets them both go. Now, thread B is unblocked and thread A is unblocked. Thread A immediately goes and joins thread B, so now it's blocked again. Meanwhile, thread B prints hello from B 
and exits that unblock say here. So hopefully this example, uh, and it may not even be on the screen long enough, but if you go and study the, the slide, hopefully this clarifies the difference between waiting on a latch and joining another thread. Um, in fact, uh, the main thread is going to call join anyway, so we can just do this. We can say uh, we're just waiting on one thread, and you don't bother decrementing it. Just wait. One thread is is still to arrive. You wait until they come. Then here you say you arrive. You decrement the counter, but you don't wait. Right? You don't need to wait. Just just decrement the counter. Prove you've been here. Go on. So no matter what order these two functions end up getting called in, right? There's no synchronization that says what order they're going to get called in, but thread A here is sort of leaving a note for thread B that says, yes, I got here. If you're waiting, unblock yourself. If you haven't started waiting yet, you don't even need to wait. So you could do this. Um, are latches copyable? No, no synchronization primitives could ever be copyable. Mutexes are not copyable. Condition variables are not copyable, right? All, all the actual things, they just sit in one place in memory uh, and you, you poke at them. They're, they're very object oriented. They have state. Um, you could not make a copy of a, of a mutex. Um, similarly, you can't make a copy of a latch. So how does this thread know where the latch is? Uh, because it captured a reference to it. The lambda captured a reference to it. And the, you know, could this reference dangle? Yes, theoretically, if thread A finished and destroyed the latch. Um, but we're using synchronization to make sure that doesn't happen. We're making sure that we join thread B and it's completely done before we destroy the latch. Synchronization with std barrier looks kind of similar. Uh, barrier, as I said, is a template which allows you to put a completion function here uh, that says, this is the thing that I also want to, by the way, like notify someone else when the barrier comes down. Latches can't do this, barrier can, so barrier is more general. So here's my barrier, the counter is initially two, um, B is setting up, A is setting up, then they both arrive and wait at the barrier. Once they are both waiting, the barrier comes down and it prints green flag go. And then we get B is running and A is running in some order. So here's another comparison of the new primitives in C20. And notice that all of them have this counter involved. So I put little graphs of how does the counter go um, for counting semaphore. Uh, different threads are acquiring and releasing, and it's going up and down by one over over and over. Actually, it can go up and down by arbitrary jumps because you can pass an argument to, to say, I want three tokens right now. Um, but uh, counting semaphore, the, the counter goes up and down. With latch, the counter starts high, goes down to zero, and then boom, you're done. One shot, that's it. Uh, the barrier, counter goes down to zero, and then boom, right back up to where it started and goes down to zero and right back up to where it started, and it keeps doing this over and over and support some extra complexity, which we most, mostly glossed over. Now we finally get to a question break um, on the new features here and, and other things. Um, uh, someone asks, is a, if I use a shared mutex, is that slower than a simple mutex? Uh, I would assume that yes, it probably is. Um, it's more complicated. If what you need is a simple mutex, use a simple mutex. If what you need is a reader-writer lock, use a shared mutex, right? It's based on what you need. Don't pay for what you don't need, but also don't think, oh, I don't want to pay, so why should the simplest possible, you know, I really need a reader-writer lock. How can I possibly simulate that with a mutex because it's cheap? Well, you can't. If there were a simple way to, simu to simulate it, they would just do that in the library, right? So use the library type that maps well onto the actual task you're attempting to perform. Here's one slide on promise and future. If you want more on this, I do have a talk from several years ago called uh, Future from Scratch, uh, which might be worth watching. Um, it's probably a little bit dated at this point. It, it um, foreshadows a lot of things that didn't actually happen in 17 and 20. Um, so uh, one slide intro, how do we do this? Um, there's a library function called std async. And what async does is spin up a new thread, do this in the thread, and then it has a return. Threads don't return things. Where does this return go? Uh, well, it goes into something called a promise, which is not shown on this slide because that's all wrapped up inside this std async helper function. And the promise communicates with a future, which is returned uh, immediately from std async. Um, this is the sort of thing that in C20, uh, we're moving toward maybe coroutines for this kind of thing. Maybe. I'm not sure. 
Um, so Stid Async instantly returns a future. And you can go on and you can async another thing, spawn off another thread, and it's doing its own job, and you get a second future. And then finally here, where we call dot get on the future, that is what blocks if it needs to, and blocks and waits and goes to sleep by the mailbox. F uh, for future, F for frosty, the other side being promise, P for pat for postman for promise. So F goes to sleep and waits until P sends it the data that it needs. And so this get will return one, this get will return two, and I'll add them together once they're both available. Um, so uh, however, this is one slide. Uh, if this sounds like something you could use in production, please do not actually base your design decision on this slide. Please go learn about this and decide whether it's appropriate for you. Um, the STL async also has serious caveats about performance uh, because it creates all these threads and uh, that can quickly run you out of resources. Uh, you really want something like a thread pool, which does not exist in the standard library. Um, <laughs> someone was at pub quiz last night. Thank you. Um, uh, someone asks, uh, if I have more threads that arrive at a barrier than the counter initially was, what happens? Um, well, once you get N of those threads at the barrier, uh, the barrier will drop and it'll go around again. And then this other thread will come in late and it will join the next group to go. And then, you know, some more will come in. And once N minus one others have come in, the barrier goes down and they'll, and they'll go around again. And, and at some point here, you might end up with, with all N minus one arriving simultaneously. So this sounds like it's going to give you UB at some point. Um, but uh, the, the goal of using something like barrier is to make sure you uh, understand all the possible things that could happen. And if one of them leads to UB, maybe you're, you've got the design wrong, right? Um, is there a good way to use thread detach? Uh, I don't talk about it here. Um, you could spin off some background job that you don't really care about what happens or it doesn't clean up very much. That, that's quite common in real life, but I'm not going to talk about it here because there's not too much to say about how to make it uh, standard nice. Um, so protect shared data with a mutex, protect every access. Um, if you have a producer consumer, use mutex and condition variable. Um, make the data, in, uh, best of all though, is avoid sharing mutable data between threads. I am already going super over time, uh, but let me very quickly get to the blue-green pattern that I did want to promote here. This comes from DevOps. Um, the idea is that you have a blue environment and a green environment. You are running with the blue environment in production. Uh, you spin up the green environment. You move all the traffic over. Finally, you can shut down the blue environment. Um, so what this actually looks like in C++, as opposed to DevOps, is maybe we have some global config map here. That's a map of, let's say, I don't know, strings to strings, some expensive data structure. And everyone in the program wants to know what is the current config. So those are our clients who are trying to connect to our website where the config is published, right? The config here is the map. Um, so everyone's trying to get at this thing. And what we're going to do is when we want to change something about the config, we're going to say, okay, well, the old config uh, was the blue version, and I'm going to uh, get a pointer to that. I am then going to make a copy of that whole config. This is the expensive part, but we're doing this while the old config is still available and people are still um, interacting with the old config. So while that's going on, in this thread that's trying to set the default host name, they're going to do all the work of, of copying the config. Um, then they're going to modify this new config. It's okay to modify it without taking a mutex lock because we are the only person yet who knows that this new config exists. Um, so we can modify it without a mutex. Finally, uh, we're going to use an atomic operation. C++ uh, 20 adds atomic operations on shared putter. Uh, and so we can atomically say uh, if the... Uh, current blue version is still what it was, no one else has swapped in a new version there, then I am going to swap in my version. We didn't talk about this verb compare exchange or compare and swap in this talk. If that is interesting to you, you're going to need a bigger boat. Um, but that's something you can do with an atomic. You can say, I want to swap atomically that value for, for my value. Um, so that's how we then publish our version. As soon as we publish it, we have to stop writing to it. The published version is read only. 
And on the read side, all we need to do is load from the atomic. Now we have a shared putter. Uh, and now we're participating in reference counting on that actual heap allocated uh, config map. Uh, and so we can go, you know, look up things in it, whatever we want to do. Uh, and we will keep holding that reference count. And that thing we're referring to will continue to be good and at least until we are done with it and drop our reference count. So we have this read-only reference counted source of truth. And anyone who wants to change it uh, reads it in order to copy it and then atomically swaps out their new version for our version. Um, so this is a pattern that is useful uh, for one-off cases, like I have a program that you know uses a bunch of threads for something, and they all want to communicate with this config map, and I didn't want to put a mutex around it. What do I do? How do I make it thread safe? Uh, this might be a pattern that could be useful for you. In conclusion, we won't get to the bonus slides, but remember, data races are undefined behavior. One way to get around data races is to use a mutex to protect all the accesses. It must be all. It must be unconditional, 100%, both the reads and the writes. Thread safe static initialization is your friend. Use static variables uh, fearlessly, right? I mean, they're still glorified globals. They're not good uh, in terms of program architecture. But in terms of thread safety, you don't have to do anything else. You don't have to use once flag. It, it's thread safe to use a static variable in C++. Uh, if you have a non-static variable that you want to initialize only once, that's when you pull out once flag. Mutex and condition variable, two great tastes that taste great together. Um, C++ 20 introduces these three new counting primitives, semaphore, latch, and barrier. Uh, and finally, for the third time in this talk, let me repeat. Uh, if your program is fundamentally multi-threaded, if you're going to write something that is you know, complicated and real-world and multi-threaded in a fundamental way, please don't base design decisions on the intro stuff in this talk. Please use, uh, you know, look into Promise Future, look into C++20 coroutines, perhaps, look into ASIO, look into TBB. Um, and again, don't base your choice on what you saw on these slides. Um, with that, let me take some more questions if we have time. And uh, bonus slides, you can see uh, when the slides are published, there will be a GitHub repo with all of the slides. Um, and I will hang out, uh, let's say, in the uh, hallway track, um, hallway track floor 10, come uh, table one, floor 10. Uh, for for uh, questions we don't get to here. Um, do we have any other questions? Um, there was a question about the coroutines. Uh, how will that change the way we use threads? Um, I think that is probably out of scope. Um, the short answer is I don't know. I don't know that much about coroutines, and especially like I know some about generators, the co yield stuff, about how co await is going to end up working with thread pools and other and executors and other things that we don't have. Uh, that is even further out of my uh, area of expertise. Um, someone asks, would semaphores be the preferred synchronization mechanism going forward for producer consumer uh, rather than a mutex condition variable? Could I use a semaphore? Um, uh, yes, I think I see how that would work. Um, would it be preferred? Uh, it might be lighter weight. Um, I might suspect that it would be lighter weight. I certainly don't know in practice. I have no you know benchmarks or anything. Um, but it's plausible to say that that if you had producer consumer, you might binary semaphore. There is a type def in the semaphore header for binary semaphore. Um, that just has a max of one and just goes up and down and up and down. Is there data for me? Yes, there is. Is there data for me? Yes, there is. Um, so yes, that, that might be appropriate if you're in 20. Um, will the bonus slides be available? Yes, they will. Um, all right. Um, I think that is it. Thank you all for coming. Enjoy the Back to Basics track. Give me feedback. Um, I also do training. Send the email. Thank you very much. I've been Arthur Edwire. <laughs>